Hello, fellow tool doctors. Welcome. So episode 270 of the Immigration Lawyers Podcast today, we're doing a conversation with Kevin Gregg, our regular monthly that we do. A little bit delayed, uh, but we talk about federal court cases, about what's going on. Very important topic to get into. It's delayed just because, you know, as, as many of you probably are getting sick as well, it's been out of control. Um, this, this like really hardcore cold and cough that's been going around. Luckily or unluckily, it wasn't COVID. It was, it was worse than COVID, frankly. But um, this is one of those things that just happened. Um, thankfully, we're able to keep things going, have a team helping. But it really showed the importance of having a team. Um, I don't know if you get older or something like that, but I'm like, we really need to have people around you to help out. And I'm really blessed to have a really good team. And um, interestingly, all of them were like podcast listeners, all the main team were podcast listeners who uh, just reached out and stuff. So it's a great recruiting tool to have these kind of public um, stuff for, 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 you know, for practice. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, the conference that I was talking about is coming up. We only have a few spots left, like five seats left. And we're going to go to a we're, we're going to work with some bar organizations to, to publicize there. So they're going to fill up fast. So if you haven't already, you want to learn how to do an O1. You want to beat the recession by having you or your associate learn the extra practice area, the O1 visa. Then you know what to do. Come to Los Angeles, February 24th, Friday, uh, and uh, be here all day. We'll have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and a good time, and a lot of uh, relatively intense review of this process. So you could go home and feel comfortable with it. That's the goal. Um, so definitely check it out. Email me at info at immigration or just go to iltbox.com and check out the postgraduate training and you can see for yourself a lot of the info there. Really email me if you have questions, we can chat about it. If you haven't already, like and, and leave a review of wherever you're watching this on iTunes, wherever to help promote the program. Uh, I want to thank the sponsors, uh, particularly DACA Wise, who's always been so gracious and helpful uh, and supportive of the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox for so, such a long time. Uh, if you haven't already, take advantage of their special discount for their annual plan that we can give you. If you go to www.dacawise.com slash immigration dash lawyers dash podcast and use the code immigration lawyers podcast uh, to get 10 percent off the annual plan. Really good service. Give it a test shot. See if you like it. I'm sure you will. Uh, and uh, having said all that, don't forget, this is just general education only, not intended for individual legal guidance. With that, let's get it started. So thanks again for coming, Greg. I love having this monthly issue or episode, this podcast issue, I guess, with you. I was, I was sick uh, last week, so we couldn't get it done earlier. Uh, but uh, look forward to talking about cases. And I guess it'll be November uh, that we go through and partially December, I guess. Well, that's right now. I mean, I don't want to do I don't want to do December because I, we got to get November. So because then if we do it in January, we'll have nothing to talk about in December. I mean, God forbid. So we, we got to we got to keep a structure or else we're we're doomed. For sure. For sure. Well, thanks for coming on again. That's my pleasure. And, you know, we've been doing a lot of talking this 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 month, as as a lot of people probably know, you came on my show and I really appreciated that. We had a great interview. I'm getting a lot of good feedback. Nice. As I said on the podcast, you were just a man doing a million things at once. I don't know how you do it. It's crazy. Um, and I think the biggest compliment you can get is my mom, number one listener and a patron, <laughs> um, thinks that you seem like a very nice and smart guy. So that is that's high right. praise, high praise and to you. She's got a wonderful son, so she knows what she's talking oh, about. Oh, look at that. Look at me just soliciting, <laughs> soliciting all these nice things. Also, um, you know, you published your magazine this month. I think I continue to think it's really cool. Volume six. I'm in it. I finally gave an article. It was a lot of fun. I hope that it proves beneficial on the categorical approach, realistic probability test. But I must say to you, and to anybody who reads that article, I did not add the baggies of cocaine to my article. You put baggies, <laughs> you you put baggies of cocaine, an image of it in my article. I I didn't, I didn't do that. And that's the magazine guy. I say pixel pictures yeah. out of that. That uh, we could do. Dude, use. dude, I don't even know if I was. I guess I. I'm sure I was talking about drugs, but that. I mean, my God, I'm like I'm looking at that. I'm like, what is? This? You just probably did an image search for primes, and it's like the first thing that popped up. You put it there. Oh my god! So I've got some, you know. So that's that was interesting, but I suppose it's par for the course if you're doing a crimmigration article. But <laughs> yeah. like, damn! Any travel coming up? Uh, both work and not work. I just got back from Chicago last week uh, for a complicated N three three six interview. I mean, really, just terrible. The, the guy voted. You know, I mean. You know, <laughs> what are you going to do? The I'm in there, but there's it. a memo, you know, there's a, yeah. uh, I can't, the, you know, the name of the USCIS director escapes me, but it's a 2003 or 2004 memo 
um, that does permit USCIS to naturalize an individual who's made a false claim to citizenship, who's even voted wow. based on a totality of the circumstances analysis. But, you know, the, the individual did not apply to naturalize with counsel. Yeah. And he, he even disclosed the unlawful voting, not realizing that it's such a big deal. But like, <laughs> yeah. you know, I mean, that individual walks through your door, you're probably like, you know what, maybe you'll be a green card holder forever. Maybe yes. we're not going to apply to naturalize. But once it's done, it's done. Right. And so, yeah. there, you know, USCIS has that discretion. I believe that we put on as good of a case as we could to really show the whole person. Yeah. And now it, I told the USCIS officer in the interview, I'm like, You've got all the cards, balls in your court. Like you have the path to it, it, yeah. I mean, it's like sometimes they just don't bother saying to removal, they just keep it open. Uh I've seen N336s do that before. Yeah. But you, you know, know, you want to the, they, the they got all the cards, it's up to them. But like this this individual, you know, I'm not gonna provide any identity information. Yeah. This individual, if there's ever an individual, this is the one. It's like they can do it. Why not do it? Yeah. This is a great individual in all but one act that, quite frankly, he believed he was allowed to. I mean, we can do a better job of teaching ethics in U.S. schools. And I don't know, it seems intuitive to you and I that LPRs can't vote. But, you know, no, no. getting into the specifics, there was a lot of people involved in this case yeah. who were U.S. citizens who thought this individual could vote. So now, well, quick yeah. question. How was N336 interview? Is it the same officer that did the case or is it a different officer? Review? It never. I, I do N336 interviews a lot. It actually can't be the same officer. I wish it could, really, because like I think it's probably a tough thing for a USCIS officer to overturn his or her colleague, you know, and I honestly never believe that these officers have the authority. To me, it seems like it's just like an officer at the same level as the initial officer. And then it goes to some back room for a decision. That's the feeling I get. Yeah. But it can't be the same officer. I wish it was. I wish we could all just come and be like, look, officer, let's do it again. But the way it's set up is an officer has to like overturn his or her colleague. Yeah. That's that's a that's a structurally difficult situation. Well, I have another question. On Saturday morning, I had a consultation where uh, the guy was outside for eight months, so they, they denied the case. But they just issued a decision. They didn't give a notice of intent to deny or something like that, give the opportunity to challenge it in writing. I'm, I feel a little cut the procedural rules, but it's like, should they have would have been mandatory to at least send annoyed first? Because yeah, I don't circumstances. I don't think it's mandatory to send annoyed, and I feel like um, the Trump administration, um, USCIS, might have issued a policy thing on it saying that you don't have to issue annoyed when it's clear. And quite frankly, you know, eight months is. is I mean, yeah. I'm sure you've got an argument, but that. That does seem like the kind of thing that's pretty open and shut, you know, more yeah. so than they lacked good moral character or something like that. But I, I, mean, I don't think, I don't think they have to send annoyed. But I'm not a hundred percent. Yeah, we're gonna end three three six it and give it a shot because if not, he's gonna wait two years anyway. So I'm like, yeah, he's not gonna lose the green card. Give it a shot. Talk about the yeah. circumstances. I mean, he was, he had some some arguments you could say because it's six to twelve between it's more than six months less than twelve months, so it's not the automatic cutoff. Right. He just went alone, so he didn't argue all this stuff. He's like, because at first he contacted me, and I'm like, oh, you don't have a chance in hell, uh, snowball's chance in hell. And then we, he's like, no, I want to talk. We need to talk. Then I got to learn the family life, life situation, and the work, income, taxes. I'm right. like, did you mention any of this stuff? He's like, no. Right. I'm like, oh, that's why you need a lawyer. That's like, what the N three three six is for. Yeah. But I mean, no, that's why you need a lawyer. But yes, that's what the N three three six is. Exactly. It's horrible. I mean, this was serious, you know, serious stuff. Not only is this, you know, a bar to naturalization, unlawful voting, but it's a ground of removability, yeah. which is, I mean, there's not, it's like pretty much open and shut and it's criminal. And so like we're in there, you know, under oath, multiple officers, like I'm just watching this guy go to the slaughter, but all the damage had already been done at the N400 yeah. stage. It's not like there was anything new. You know, this is your worst night bad it's feeling. 400 and it just yeah. comes up, right? But yeah. this was already the N336 and that's what you got. It's like, look, here's all the cards. It's all here. It's all been honest the whole time. Be what a nice a, agency. Be a, this is this is not this is not like voter fraud trying to screw the system. This is an individual trying to be a good citizen, you know? Like that's the horrible part of it. Like the individual thought that he was doing a, the right thing, trying to being a good member of society. It's really a it's really a stupid gotcha. Yeah. In my respected opinion. Well, thanks for fighting it. Uh so what do we have in store for us this month? That's not even why we talk. We've got cases, three cases, the good cases. And for November I decided I'd pick on the Board of Immigration Appeals only because the circuits 
and the Attorney General picked on the Board of Immigration Appeals. So three cases. First, La Parra de Leon v. Garland out of the first on November 4th, 2022. This is the First Circuit vacating matter of La Parra. Same case title, La Parra de Leon. It's matter of La Parra, which was the board's in absentia motion to reopen decision, where they said, essentially, that even if the notice to appear is deficient, doesn't have the date, time, or location of the first hearing. And that's what starts the removal proceedings. And then the non-citizen is ordered to remove in absentia. Even if you got a deficient NTA, you still have to show that you didn't receive the notice of hearing or that you provided an address. The same in absentia motion to reopen framework, really, that you've always had. Pereira and Chavez, we don't care, said the board in matter of Lupara. The thing is, is that the in absentia reopening statute itself, unlike some of these other statutes where the deficient NTA issues are getting brought up, the in absentia reopening statute expressly links up to INA section 239A, which is the statute that defines a notice to appear. So it's a pretty similar logic, almost identical logic to the one being used by the Supreme Court in Pereira and Ms. Chavez with the stop time rule but just in an absentia reopening. They all link up to INA section 239A. And to me, and to Justice Gorsuch, and to a lot of judges, if you're linking 239A into the statute, then you have a statutory requirement to comply and to provide a uh, compliant notice to appear. Mm -hmm. The in absentia reopening statute does that. Matter of Opara apparently arose in the First Circuit, so the First Circuit got it on direct petition for review and vacated it, saying the text is the text. To, they didn't quite say you have to reopen the, this in absentia order. They sent it back for other analysis, but Matter of Opara is vacated. It seems like it's the First Circuit is agreeing with the Ninth Circuit in Singh to say a deficient NTA needs to be reopened. If it's an, absent, an absentia order removal premised on a deficient NTA needs to be reopened. And again, that's now the First Circuit and the Ninth Circuit. These are thousands and thousands of in absentia removal orders issued since 1997 based on deficient NTAs. And these individuals, I don't know, maybe they're married to U.S. citizens now. They, maybe they are adjustment eligible to get this. Maybe they need to go and <clears throat> consular process. But the in absentia removal order was an unwaivable five-year bar for example. So these We're, things are crazy. Like, it seems like all the circuit courts are going on the side of these deficient notices being a problem. And it's only the BIA who's like not doing that. Unfortunately, that's not true. There's a complete circuit split. And I've been talking about it on my show. It's got to go to the Supreme Court next term. It really has to, because uh, this is, of course, a Supreme Court creation of but, you know, it's a DHS not complying with INA 239A for 25 years creation. But the 11th Circuit has flat out said the opposite. The 11th Circuit is we don't care. Oh, okay. In absentia reopening. You got to show notice of hearing. Same thing we always had to show. The 5th Circuit, which is the other border circuit in addition to the 9th, is all over the place. Uh, first, they issued the Rodriguez decision. They were the first circuit to touch this. It was crazy. And it was the 5th. And they were essentially, and as I read Rodriguez, they're saying, you got to reopen these. And it's the Fifth Circuit. All, like Harlingen has ordered, you know, half the country ordered removed in absentia. I mean, it, it's crazy. And that was like the dream period for a couple months. And then different panels in the Fifth started chipping away at Rodriguez, Spagno, Bastos, a variety of cases. There was a decision just last week where the chief judge issued a concurrence to explain the chaos that is in his absentia reopening in the Fifth Circuit. And now essentially in the Fifth, you have to show that you that the non-citizen provided uh, DHS, USCIS, UAR, whatever, with a proper address. So it's not so much, as I read it, that you have to show that you didn't receive the notice of hearing, like always used to be the case, but you have to show that you provided a proper address. It's going to be difficult to do all these decades later. Yeah. And that is based on another statute, to be honest, as I said on my show, I don't quite see how that really um, is important when it's the in absentia reopening statute linking up to 239A. The First Circuit addresses this issue. The Ninth Circuit addresses this issue. I mean, the First and the Ninth say the opposite. The mm -hmm. Fifth Circuit in Rodriguez shot down an en banc challenge in Rodriguez. So one would think that all of this was kind of resolved in the Fifth, yeah. but, you know, the panels... 
the chief judge essentially said this wasn't argued in last week. The chief judge said the this wasn't argued in Rodriguez, so I don't even know if Rodriguez is good law, which is not how it works, but that was a concurrence. And obviously many judges in the fifth don't like Rodriguez. Anyway, the fifth is all over the place. The 11th is on the other side. The board said matter of Lapara, the first and the ninth on the other side of reopening. I would argue, as I've argued so often on the podcast, and I might even have a note on this issue soon with a great intern we had, that matter of Lapara is now zombie precedent that it shouldn't exist anywhere because matter of Lepara itself arose in the first circuit and then the first circuit vacated it. There does not exist a matter of Lepara anymore. It's not the same as when like, you know, the ninth circuit as it did in Singh refuses to defer to Lepara. Yeah. But then, then, you know, it doesn't apply in the ninth, but it applies everywhere else. But in this case, the first circuit that says matter of Lepara, you don't exist anymore. Vacated. I would argue it doesn't exist anywhere. Nobody else makes that argument. So I guess I'm wrong, but I don't know why I'm wrong. So I'm going to keep <laughs> arguing it. <laughs> keep up the good fight. <laughs> so that is deficient NDAs. Much more on that than you probably wanted to hear, but I can't talk about deficient NTA motions to reopen in absentia any without going down that path anymore. It's got to be on the docket next term. It's got to be. And who knows? I mean, Pereira was nine to uh, was eight to one. With only, I want to say, Alito in dissent. Niz Chavez was, I believe, six to three. So started, uh, they were with Niz Chavez with, you know, the notice of hearing issued. The court was like, I don't know. So now that we'll have in absentia reopening when there are literally, I don't know, 500,000 in absentia removal orders at issue. We'll see what the court says. But that shouldn't matter. We're a textualist court, right? The text is what it is. If the Supreme Court goes against the ninth and... The first, it'll probably be with the rationale that the fifth just used, but last week, which I'll get to maybe next month on your podcast. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> um, Zaragoza v. Garland out of the Seventh Circuit. I'll be much quicker with this. This is the matter of Thomas and Thompson issue. A uh, matter of Thomas and Thompson was the Attorney General Barr's decision that said essentially. It vacated three BIA decisions. I've got them in front of me. It's a matter of, uh, what, three decisions. Matter of Cota Vargas, matter of Song, and matter of Estrada, which all talk about what happens when criminal convictions get vacated, modified, um, amended, like all these different things that can happen in states, mm -hmm. even if they're for immigration purposes. Matter of Song, Cota Vargas, Estrada said essentially that the immigration courts need to defer to what the state court is doing. Mm -hmm. It was only a matter of pickering that I believe it was with vacated convictions that it said it has to be vacated for procedural or substantive or constitutional defects. Can't be for immigration purposes, rehabilitative purposes, any of that. Mm -hmm. Song, Cota Vargas, and Estrada with like amendments and modifications, I think was letting that stuff in. But vacated convictions had to be procedural or substantive for immigration law to give it effect. In matter of Thomas and Thompson, <clears throat> Attorney General Barr said, ah, out with those other three BIA decisions. The only thing that's good law is a matter of pickering. So any amendment, modification, vacation, anything to a criminal conviction, it's got to be for procedural substantive defect or, um, or immigration is going to it's going to listen to it. It's a very harsh rule for non-citizens. Yeah. You know, when the state says we don't want this person to have the consequences anymore, immigration will turn around and say, we don't, we don't care. We're still going to punish them. Um, Interesting. Really, immigration is still fighting that, but that I thought they would have let that go or something. Yeah. I mean, look, attorney, um, attorney general Garland could vacate matter of Thomas and Thompson and put back into effect the three published BIA decisions, yeah. but he has not done so yet. Matter of, um, matter of um, this the Seventh Circuit decision, Zaragoza v. Garland, unfortunately, says that Thomas and Thompson is OK, says that the Immigration Nationality Act is ambiguous. And so what the attorney general did was reasonable. But it said that it has to apply prospectively, can't apply retroactively. So that's a bit of a win for non-citizens. Um, you know, so sentence modifications. Uh, amendments, all that stuff that happened before Matter of Thomas and Thompson was published, which I want to say is in 2019, might be 2018. Oh, it is. It's October 25th, 2019. 
that's still good. That's still the old framework. Oh, so that's okay. a, that, so that so Thomas and Thompson don't apply retroactively in the Seventh Circuit, but of course you could argue that everywhere. Okay, and, you know, I, the I'm end, gonna send your respect for saying oh, that's good. Okay, right. Yeah. So I mean that's something. It's not good. I, I would have preferred that the Seventh said this is not reasonable, but who am I? Again, Attorney General Garland can do that. And then what Attorney General Garland would do would then be deferred to in the seventh, because again, the seventh has just said that the statute is ambiguous and we're going to defer to what the Attorney General says. So really, <clears throat> Attorney General Garland could do it. I'm sorry, I'm just getting over a bit of a cold. I'll cough I one more time. Uh, I got that too. I, was, I, I haven't published a podcast in like weeks. It's like, it can't sick get better. And then this cough I was like, yeah. that's what we canceled last week. It was terrible. It's, everyone's probably getting this one. You know, it's funny you mentioned Matter of Estrada, and in my head, because I do adjustment and stuff like that a lot. Like hey, Matter of Estrada is a two forty five I case, and I'm like, okay, there's two Matter of Estrada. Maybe there's probably a lot of us. Yeah, <laughs> that's a popular last name. <laughs> I wanted to jump in for a quick second and talk about one of our wonderful new sponsors, Immigration Evaluation Directory Did you know research reports psychological evaluations can increase an asylum applicant's chance of approval by seventy eight percent? Psychological evaluations are hugely beneficial in hardship, cancellation, asylum, and other types of immigration cases, whether with USCIS or the Immigration Court. Connecting with qualified clinicians has never been easier thanks to the immigration evaluation directory.com. Free to use, you can filter the directory by location, language, case type, and more, then review profiles and reach out. The immigration evaluation directory is your one-stop resource to find the best therapist to help explore more today at immigration evaluation directory.com and get the help that you need. Well, you know what the seventh circuit, it was interesting logic on retroactivity because it's not just Thomas and Thompson where retroactivity analysis is are done every single time the board changes their law in a way that hurts non-citizens. There's an argument that that new board decision can't be applied retroactively. Mm, yeah. Good point. And, you know, removal proceedings often, especially in the criminal context, are tethered to criminal conduct that happened years ago. Yeah. And so when is it that the board's decision can apply? You saw the board change the theft type CIMT definition in 2016, and the courts of Yamara Diaz Lizarraga and the circuits have universally said Diaz Lizarraga, to the extent it can be applied, can only be applied prospectively. Can't apply to convictions, these theft type convictions that happened pre-2016. Mm -hmm. those have to be adjudicated under the old CIMT framework. And here too, the seventh is saying that Mr. Zaragoza, Mrs. Zaragoza, I'm sorry, <clears throat> her rights essentially vested at the time that she got her sentence vacated. That's when she was entitled to rely on the old framework, even if she didn't actually know about it, even if she didn't actually rely. So that's, that's a non-citizen friendly retroactivity point it's the point where the rights become favorable to the non-citizen so you know interesting to note whenever the bia or the attorney general yeah change old bia precedent that's non-citizen friendly you've got good retroactivity arguments anti-retroactivity arguments very cool well it's good to know i mean how do you how does a practitioner practitioner know to do all this stuff they get a case of conviction they have to know okay this is like there's a lot of stuff you got to know if you do a immigration. That's right. And, you know, I mean, they 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 need to not they need to contact individuals like me or uh, Sabrina Damers and, you know, in L.A. I mean, Sabrina does it from, you know, she gets the convictions vacated and she does immigration stuff. But most immigration attorneys like me, we only do the immigration side. But we have criminal attorneys all the time um, hire us to <clears throat> do analyses of what the immigration consequences are and what how you need to get it vacated under your state's law for it to hold up. I know what the Florida statute is, for example, but every state has its own uh, statute for getting a conviction vacated. I'm learning the California ones. I've done a, quite a few cases on it, but you know that's really criminal defense. I don't want to stay out stray outside of my lane. So I mean, I think that you how how do you do it? You got to contact an immigration attorney. Um, you know when you get a vacated, yeah. Um, very interesting stuff. Yeah, it's, uh, I get these calls for people who like want these crimmigration letters. I'm like, call them the wrong person. <laughs> I'm not gonna write this stuff. We do. We do quite a few crimmigration yeah, letters. We do quite a few. Yeah, and, it's, it's and every time I, yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What? No, I'm sorry. Every time I put my name to it, um, I feel, um, 
it's it's scary, right? Like these things become like five to ten pages single spaced. You got to make sure you caught everything, and they might accept a plea based on what you said. And then if you're wrong, you know. Yeah, it's, I mean, when people call for it, they think it's like just write a quick letter. They think it's like a twenty minute thing. Like, no, this is like the hardcore lawyer right here. Yeah. Everything's on the line. I mean, it's good you commit malpractice if you mess that up because they take the criminal conviction, and next thing you know, they're coming at you with a bar complaint. So yeah, they're they're not they're not feel good, but you know, I mean, I I know why they need them. Yeah, yeah, this is a whole practice you can make just on this stuff. You can get to know the crim, uh, criminal attorneys and like talk with them and just have a referral basis for these because in California, Florida, Texas, this is like regular stuff that pops up. That's why I wrote a realistic probability article for your magazine. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way for those who are listening. You know, we, get, we need content. Uh, if you want to get known, you know, that's the thing to do. Just whatever you're good at, just come and write about it. It's a great magazine. Love it. Thank I think you. it's really cool. Yeah, we're at number six. You know, one day we're looking, it's going to be like 50 of them. Like, wow, you know, I have an institution at that point uh, yeah. that's consistent. It, yeah. uh, literally drains my body because i'm like i'm like running a practice and all this to do it yeah. but i think long term it's really gonna it's totally worth it i agree entirely and I'll, I'll give you something else eventually but i just gotta gotta take a breather and i'll continue to publicize it in my firm for more attorneys to give you content oh thank you so much thank you the last case i got is matter of coronado acevedo which is a it sounds like a board decision it's an attorney general garland decision not attacking the board, attacking his predecessor, Attorney General Sessions, not attacking anyone. I take that back. Just vacating matter of SOG and FDB, which, in my opinion, the writing was on the wall when Attorney General Garland vacated matter of Castro Tum. So really, I think this, this is about a year and a half late, but it's the same logic. This is essentially Jeff Sessions had said that it's immigration judges can't terminate cases unless removability can't be established. That's paraphrasing. Relying on matter of Castro Tum, which was the administrative closure decision that Attorney General Sessions had issued. And now Attorney General Garland has said, no, no. Immigration judges are allowed to be judges. They're allowed to control their docket. They're allowed to do what's just and equitable and terminate decisions. Now, like Attorney General Garland's other decisions, he has vacated matter of SOG mm -hmm. pending regulations. Hopefully those regulations come about and a challenge can resolve itself out before the 2024 election. But that is what Attorney General Garland has done. And in the interim, he's the Attorney General has said that immigration judges can be judges and terminate cases. Now, he, the Attorney General has given examples of where the non-citizen has obtained lawful permanent residence after being placed in removal proceedings, or where the pendency of removal proceedings cause adverse immigration consequence for a respondent who must travel abroad to obtain a visa. That's a pretty good instance. Or where termination is necessary for the respondent to be eligible to seek immigration relief before USCIS. So that seems a bit broad, that, that third one. Um, so there are there are guardrails that Attorney General Garland has said. As I said when I did the case on my podcast, I wish he had talked about BIA precedent that says termination is appropriate, where there's been a due process violation that may or other circumstances where proceedings are themselves fundamentally unfair. I mean, you can imagine an egregious situation, right, where law enforcement stops an individual solely because he looks like a Hispanic individual and then beats him up horrifically for no reason, which then leads him to admit that he is, you know, a non-citizen. And yeah. even if they could, and maybe let's assume that there was other information that they could establish alienage with. Well, there is a 1980 board decision that I argue says that it doesn't matter whether or not ICE can establish alienage in a different way. Proceedings in that egregious circumstance are so fundamentally unfair that you just can't do it. The whole thing has been tainted. You got to terminate. Mm -hmm. That case law exists. There's also circuit precedent. I wish Attorney General Garland had mentioned it in matter of Coronado Acevedo, but it's there independent of matter of Coronado yeah. Acevedo. I argue it. Continue to argue it. They need to hire you to as a consultant on this kind of stuff so they, they catch all these different things they're supposed to get into 
the, the Department of Justice, you want to send yeah. me to DOJ Maine, I'm I'll I'll answer the call if my phone rings. <laughs> I used to do that kind of, I mean, not in particular that, but we were at EOIR in San Diego, right, as a counsel for, for EOIR? That's right. You, know, you work for the immigration judges, help them in their drafting of decisions, and sometimes work on policy stuff as well. Um, but no, I mean, it's not not anything like that. I'll, I, I mean, heck, that seems like a good job. I'm sure that Attorney General Garland has good people. I don't think Attorney General Garland wants to do as much as I might want to do. Yeah. Um, because I do believe that the Democrats think that immigration is a bit of a third rail that they don't want to touch. Yeah. Um, you get the votes I, and they don't do anything <laughs> or barely anything. I believe it. I, I don't, I don't think it's a secret that, it, I mean, I don't, I guess I've got no hard proof, but I believe it's been said that the sessions and bar and all of them were, were outsourcing the decisions that they were issuing in part to fair, which yeah. is like you know, totally I mean, it's been designated a hate group by some entities and Stephen Miller came from it and uh, other people who were in the HS well. came from yeah. FAIR. Um, it's been, I believe that it's been publicly admitted that like, and you know, the, the Trump administration AGs were issuing decisions every three months at a minimum. Lame duck it. Four different AGs issued decisions under Trump, including AG Whitaker and AG Rosen. AG Rosen was a temporary AG as a lame duck after Trump lost the election. And he's still issued, I believe, two presidential decisions. So the Trump administration did not care and issued at least a dozen presidential immigration decisions. And it doesn't appear that that same appetite is there for <laughs> Attorney General Garland, I believe that Attorney General Garland, the only substantive decision he has issued was the uh, matter of BZR vacating um, matter of GGS, which was a board decision during the Obama years, which had held that you can't consider the mental health of a non-citizen the particularly serious crime analysis. That was more substantive by the attorney general saying you can consider mental health. But everything else the attorney general has done was, was simply like just vacating Trump uh, bar and session decisions in four or five pages. So pending regulations. So I, I don't think the appetite is quite there. Uh, I'd be happy to go work for DOJ Maine if DOJ Maine wants me. <laughs> well, good stuff. I mean, you got the memory to be able to cite these names and stuff like it's nothing. Um, so it's probably very few people that can do that. Um, so you're a great candidate. Appreciate you saying that. Totally a product of me just doing the podcast and reading the cases every week. You know, we talked about the importance of the podcast. Like it really develops your skill at the next level to be forced to know stuff right because you got to save the public and look at the yep. level of sophistication you have and what your practice is. It makes you one of the best, really. So like, you know, people, if you want to get out there, you know, write a lot, go teach, uh, do podcasts. It really builds up your expertise in what you do. When I had to teach at law school, when I was a, at Loyola and Pepperdine, like I had to force me to learn all these areas of immigration law, which I'd never practice. But I'm like, they're going to ask me. So I had to sit and study it, say right. it out loud, who ask questions, and I got to think about it, read the statute. It really forced you to push yourself, not just do the same cover letter over and over again. It's 100% on the substance. Um and there's another thing, though, that I always tell people, and, and yours yours is a bit different because you've outsourced your editing, <laughs> but you didn't used to, but, or you just go live sometimes. But like me, I, I'm spending hours each week editing my these cases because, you know, I just, I can't, I'm not going to not, and it's substantive and I don't, yeah, I don't trust anyone you know. else yet. And there is nothing like editing your own voice to make you into a better public speaker. Because every time I say an uh or a yeah. the or a filler word or if I misspeak, that's another 15, 20, 30 seconds of editing, minute of editing. I mean, it could be a whole episode. It's like a whole other hour to speak clearly. There's nothing like doing two, 10 podcast episodes to make you take out all the filler words and to make you a bit of a better public speaker. Yeah, editing my podcast got rid of my ums. I was every other word saying um. And then editing that out took so much time where I'm like, uh, I, I just got to pay attention. I can't be doing this. <laughs> right. Go crazy. Right. It can't now, go, go crazy. Listening to our interview, I, I get excited and I talk fast. And then I realize I don't finish a sentence or like some words, you just don't hear them in there. 
And I always have to be conscious of that to speak slower and make sure I say every word rather than just like running through it. And that's something that's like, I, I lose track of when I get too excited talking about whatever I'm talking about. You're definitely a fast speaker. I definitely also realized that during my edit of our episode, but I still think that it's, that it was very good and, uh, and understandable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Public speaking is such an important skill to have. I'm, I'm like, <laughs> I should practice it much more. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but I love it. I, uh, I'm looking at my outline before we go. You say, you know, you complimented me on uh, knowing the cases and um, I'm, I appreciate that, but it really is all because of the podcast. Would you like to know how many pages as of this moment, my podcast outline is of all the cases that I've done since May, 2020? Uh, it's like a couple hundred pages. It is 1,427 pages. And it is over 611,000 words. <laughs> you control that. Does the computer take a while to kind of process it? It's getting a bit slow. Yeah, the control, but I still use control F all the time. I mean, it's my secret weapon, my podcast outline, you know, like, but, I, you know, I, I've got my uh, every case bulleted. That is a public uh, website on the Kurzban website where every de decision you want to find a Guatemalan asylum case you want to find a certain Minnesota statute control findability you can find all the cases on the Kurzban website but the actual summaries that's my own that's my own personal thing at, at this time you know there's the gentleman who I think at DC who has some sort of digest he does um, Ben Winograd Winograd yeah so he's I mean, a very smart guy I talk about him a lot on the podcast because he gets so many wins for non-citizens and the fourth i try to have him on the podcast uh he's a very private person uh the no response but uh i like to have these people i mean you can market his his, his good so there too but uh, it's try, him, try, try him again ben's a ben's a very nice guy he's a brilliant guy he speaks at the conferences so i don't you know he'll, he'll, he'll do it the, the newsletter even though i don't need it because my practice type just for the to kind of get my way in so maybe he listens to this and like oh, maybe he should, should respond to john and come on the show <laughs> just ben, ben's ben's great he, he should he, he'd be great um but you know he uh, right now ben's been doing the unpublished bia decisions for for longer than i've been an attorney uh an immigration attorney i think and that is an exceptionally helpful digest as well. So similar, similar thing. Well, good stuff, man. So what are you gonna do for the holidays? Stay around here, do the variety of things that I haven't done. Yeah. And then you got a lot of yourself. stuff, like working on the house and stuff. Yeah, working on the house, doing doing other stuff, seeing my wife's family. Um I was going to say something, but it's a secret. And so if I set it on this, then that secret might come out. So I'm not going to say it. And we can talk about it next January. You can ask me about how the secret went. Okay. I got to remember that, but, uh, or maybe I'll just uh, wait offline and <laughs> that's because tell me what it is. Right, 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 right. <laughs> but thanks for coming on again. We can try to get this out as soon as possible. Uh, much appreciated. And I'll see you again next month. My pleasure. Happy holidays to everybody. Thanks.